The commission will come to order. And good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here for this uh, very important Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe hearing. Uh, I'd like to welcome our distinguished witnesses. It is not often that we have the honor of hearing from three assistant secretaries at the same time, including two who also serve as Helsinki commissioners. So you really should be up here uh, asking the questions. But thank you for being here, and thank you for your work on behalf of human rights and, and all of the three baskets that make up the Helsinki Final Act. Today we'll explore the U.S. policy towards the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, a unique intergovernmental organization that incorporates human rights and economic development into its comprehensive concept of security. Unfortunately, over the past several years, OSCE countries with poor human rights records have been able to thwart some of the organization's work on these issues. Last December at the Astana Summit, the OSCE's first summit since 1999, OSCE states failed to reach consensus on an action plan laying out priorities for the coming years. Yet the OSCE needs to continue to focus on fundamental human rights issues. This is its heritage, the reason it was created in the 1970s. It must not allow itself to be sidetracked by Russia or other un- or semi-democratic states, which argue that the organization should look only at positive examples of best practices or that distract the OSCE from its work by insisting on lengthy discussions of OSCE reform. Likewise, our own government must raise the priority given to human rights and humanitarian concerns from supporting oppressed people of Belarus turning back the trend to restrict internet and media freedoms, support democracy in Kyrgyzstan, democratic activists throughout all of Central Asia, making sure the OSCE partnership program is used to generally promote human rights for oppressed minorities. And as for the Copts in Egypt, helping OSCE countries to address the disturbing and potentially tragic demographic trends found in almost all uh, of the member states. All of these have been the subject of recent commission hearings, and as we look forward to working with the executive branch on each and every one of these issues. One issue I'd like to particularly raise here is the international child abduction issue. I would note parenthetically, and unfortunately due to scheduling, I will have to be absent for most of this hearing, but at two o'clock I'll be hearing uh, as chairman of the Global Health, Global Human Rights Africa subcommittee uh, from Susan Jacobs and um, um, uh, and others uh, about the efforts uh, to bring children home uh, who have been abducted uh, throughout the world. The Hague Treaty is now some 30 years old, and unfortunately, uh, much of its, its um, implementing uh, processes have been thwarted or mitigated by countries, especially government authorities that have refused to take seriously uh, their obligations and, you know, the uh, the hearing will focus on many of these countries with a particular emphasis on Japan. So I, regrettably, I will have to leave for that. Again, this hearing was actually put on uh, before or after, I should say, uh, that hearing. Uh, I would also point out that at the OSC Parliamentary Assembly in Belgrade earlier this month, uh, there was a resolution that we had authored as a commission to take up the issue of international parental child abductions by promoting better implementation of the Hague Convention. Uh, my hope is that at the OSCE Ministerial in Vilnius this year, uh, we could look at standards for OSCE states to fill the gaps in the convention's implementation. Uh, like I said, 30 years after its signing, uh, there are huge gaps that must, must be uh, looked at. I'd like to also say that, and I mentioned this to um, uh, Assistant Secretary Posner just a moment ago, but last week we held a very disturbing hearing here in this room and heard from three distinguished witnesses, including Michelle Clark, who all of you will recall was the director of OSCE trafficking uh, work. Uh, she did a landmark report uh, on partner country Egypt and focused on the issue of the abduction and the forced marriages of Coptic women, often starting as early as 14 and 15 years of age, uh, who were then forced into Islam and then after that forced to take up a Muslim uh, uh, husband. If that isn't a definition of trafficking, I don't know what it is. This has been reported on, as I think all of you know in the past, uh, in a cursory way, perhaps, uh, by many human rights reports. But she said, and she said it with emphasis, that the idea that it's a mere allegation must be stricken from the record, uh, that this is now a common practice 
And she estimated, and she did on-the-ground investigations, and frankly, she actually told us she would be going back to do more on-the-ground uh, human rights investigations, uh, that, that thousands of Coptic girls every year now are being abducted and forced into uh, Muslim marriages, uh, obviously against their will, against the will of their families, uh, and drugs and rape are very often uh, a means to uh, expedite uh, that conversion and that marriage. Uh, an, an absolute horrific situation that has gotten scant coverage. I plan uh, or actually offered a, a, uh, an amendment to the Foreign Relations Bill when it was marked up last week in committee condemning this egregious practice. And uh, many of the members uh, wanted more information after the markup, uh, which we are providing and have provided. And I do think it's an issue we need to engage uh, robustly. I'd like to introduce our first panel, beginning first with Dr. Philip Gordon who serves as Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs. Prior to assuming his position, he was a fellow, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. He also served as Director for European Affairs at the National Security Council under President Clinton. Uh, Michael Posner serves as Assistant Secretary for State for Democracy, Human Rights and Labor. Prior to his current position, he was Executive Director and then President of Human Rights First and I would just say, personally, I've worked with him for decades, and it's great to have him before the commission. Before joining Human Rights First, uh, he practiced law in Chicago, and he also worked for uh, the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights, which obviously became Human Rights First. Then we'll hear from a Ambassador Alexander Verschbau, who serves as Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs, a career Foreign Service officer. He has served as U.S. Ambassador to NATO, the Russian Federation, and the Republic of Korea. He's held numerous senior level foreign policy positions, principally focused on the former Soviet Union and the Balkans. Uh, so I'd like to now uh, ask um, our first uh, panelist, Dr. Gordon, uh, if he would proceed. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm honored to be here and appreciate the opportunity to talk about our agenda for the OSC. I am particularly pleased to be sitting here with my friends and close colleagues, Mike Posner uh, and Sandy Verschbell. Uh, I'd like to focus my remarks today on the OSC since the December 2010 Astana Summit, uh, which I attended along with Secretary Clinton. And I'd like to begin by looking at our core foreign policy goals for the organization, uh, reviewing our achievements at Astana and looking forward to the OSC's ministerial in Vilnius this December. I've submitted a longer version for the record uh, and would like to just summarize here if I may. That objection, your full statement, and that of our distinguished witnesses will be made a part of the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, our approach to the OSC rests firmly on the foundation of relations with Europe and Eurasia as a whole. Europe remains a key national priority for the United States for the simple reason that nowhere does the United States have better or more valuable partners than in Europe. The United States and Europe share common values, our economies are intertwined, and our militaries work together to address common security challenges. U.S. bilateral engagement with Europe is complemented by key multilateral institutions, including the OSCE. Through the OSCE, we engage on such U.S. priorities as advancing human rights and fundamental freedoms, building democratic institutions throughout the OSCE area, and advancing good governance in the economic and environmental spheres and military transparency. Uh, in this period of tight budgets, multilateral approaches often present an effective alternative to unilateral engagement. Today, uh, as you said, Mr. Chairman, the principles and commitments embodied by the OSC face some serious challenges, both from the inside and outside of the organization. From within, uh, there is an uneven application of the Helsinki principles. Regional crises and transnational threats are proliferating. Uh, efforts to resolve the protracted conflicts, for example, in Georgia, Moldova, and Nagorno-Karabakh, continue to face very frustrating obstacles. Uh, to take another example, Russia's determination to limit the role of the OSC in Georgia has diminished possibilities for international engagement in this region where transparency and confidence building are sorely needed. Problems like these make headlines, uh, but they offer only a partial picture of the OSC because the OSC has also made tremendous contributions toward advancing democratic prosperity and stability throughout Europe and Eurasia. Although it is at times stymied by a lack of political will, the OSC nonetheless remains uniquely positioned to build confidence through military transparency, promote good governance, and protect human rights and fundamental freedoms in Europe and Eurasia. At the Astana summit last December, which was the first OSC summit in 11 years, uh, the 56 participating states issued the Astana Commemorative Declaration, 
which was a strong reaffirmation of the Helsinki principles and commitments of the entire OSC Aki, including for the very first time an explicit statement that human rights situations in participating states are matters of, quote, direct and legitimate concern to all. Because of disagreements over the protracted conflicts, we were indeed unable to get consensus on an action plan at Astana, but the final document tasked future chairmanships to develop a plan to address a range of common challenges. Since the summit, we've been working with the Lithuanian chairmanship uh, as new challenges present themselves. Among these has been Belarus. After a flawed presidential election, the government of Belarus launched a brutal crackdown against the opposition and civil society following and closed the OSC office in Minsk. Through the invocation of the Moscow mechanism and other efforts, we are working to hold the government of Belarus accountable for its failure to protect human rights and fundamental freedoms. In close consultation with Senator Cardin and others on this committee, we have also taken concrete actions to address the tragic case of Sergei Magnitsky, a lawyer who died in pretrial detention in Russia. We've also worked with the chairmanship to support greater OSC assistance for North Africa. For example, ODIR, at the request of Egyptian activists, is already holding a workshop for Egyptian civil society on international standards of election observation in advance of Egypt's November parliamentary elections. Looking forward to the December OSC ministerial in Vilnius, the United States is working with our partners to achieve results in all three dimensions. Very briefly, in political military dimension, we want to agree on a substantial update of the OSC's central arms control document agreement, the Vienna document, which we hope will be reissued at Vilnius for the first time since 1999. In the economic environmental dimension, we want to endorse greater economic transparency, good governance, and anti-corruption measures, as well as work with the special representative on gender issues to empower women in the economic sphere. In the human dimension, we hope to take the Helsinki Final Act into the digital age with a decision that would explicitly acknowledge that human rights and fundamental freedoms can apply to online activity as they do to offline activity. We want to reaffirm and strengthen government's commitment to the protection of journalists. We all know that a consensus-based organization with 56 participating states sometimes moves in frustratingly small steps. The issues the OSC faces can seem intractable, but exchanging words is better than exchanging bullets, which unfortunately we have experienced in the OSC space in the last three years. The OSC has not yet lived up to its full potential, but the OSC does good and vital work and remains essential for protecting human rights, promoting stability, and spreading democracy throughout the region. The Helsinki Commission, uh, you, Mr. Chairman, the commissioners, and the experts on your staff play a vital role in ensuring that the participating states keep the promises made at Helsinki. Uh, with your support, the United States will continue to play a leading role in the OSCE to strengthen and build upon the progress participating states have made over the past 35 years and bring us closer to a truly stable, secure, and prosperous OSCE region. Thank you. Gordon, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, I said to note there are eight consecutive votes on the floor uh, right now. I have 30 seconds to get to the floor. Uh, Co-Chairman Ben Cardin will be here momentarily, uh, but until then, we will stand in momentarily recess. Again, I apologize to our witnesses. You guys can just... The uh, commission will come back to order. I apologize, uh, as, as I think uh, uh, Chairman Smith has indicated, the, the House has a series of votes. Senate's waiting on the House. Um, we may be waiting a long time for what I understand, so we, um, we're, we're, we're sort of in that position. Obviously, the timing of this hearing was, was um, uh, we didn't anticipate that the, we would be in the midst of these negotiations concerning the budget. So. We apologize to all of our witnesses. 
I understand that, uh, Secretary Gordon, you've already completed your opening statement, so we'll go to Secretary Posner. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Cardin. Um, I ask that my uh, written testimony be uh, submitted to the record. Without objection, all of your statements will be included in the record. Great. Um, first, uh, I want to thank you for holding uh, this important hearing at this time, and I want to focus my uh, brief remarks on the uh, human rights and human dimension aspect of uh, the OSCE. Uh, first, for us, uh, the OSCE is an important forum for raising uh, human rights uh, issues in individual countries of concern. And in the written testimony, I focus in particular on Belarus, uh, Russia, and Uzbekistan. As uh, Assistant Secretary Gordon uh, uh, said, with respect to Belarus, um, we see a refusal to extend the mandate of the OSCE office in Minsk. Uh, it's hindering of the Moscow mechanism by not allowing a special rapporteur into the country, and now their resistance to joining consensus on the agenda for the Human Dimension Implementation Meeting in Warsaw. Uh, but it, by its obstructionist behavior, Belarus only draws more attention to its uh, poor human rights record. Um, we also... Uh, uh, have been and will continue to uh, press for human rights with respect to Russia. Um, we've spoken out repeatedly at the OSCE Permanent Council and in other OSCE fora about the, un uh, about the many unresolved cases, uh, uh, like the murder of journalist uh, Paul uh, Klebnikov, human rights activist Natalia Estimarova, and the corruption and uh, impunity is exemplified in the tragic case of Sergei Magnitsky. Senator Cardin, you, uh, a case in which you've played uh, such an important role in drawing uh, international attention, and we thank you for that. Uh, also, restrictions on free assembly for groups like uh, Strategy 31. For us, the OSCE is particularly important, though, in the five Central Asian states, which don't really have another regional forum. Uh, and so the comprehensive uh, security we seek in the OSC region and in Central Asia particularly, particular will remain elusive until a range of serious human rights problems are addressed. Um, there is a pattern, for example, of serious ri human rights violations in uh, Uzbekistan. We've consistently raised our concerns uh, in cases like that of Dilamud Said, a journalist who is imprisoned for writing about corruption, Maxim Popov, who remains incarcerated for working on uh, AIDS issues, um, and we continue to advocate for fair treatment and due process in these and similar cases. We are committed to working with civil society in Uzbekistan and other Central Asian countries to advance democratic reforms uh, at, at a moment where uh, those issues uh, are extremely difficult. But sometimes the engagement does yield results, and I want to point in a positive way to the uh, actions by the government of Kyrgyzstan, which has decriminalized libel, an issue in which the OSCE representative on freedom of the media has persistently focused. A second broad point I want to make is that the OSCE remains a pioneering process relevant in today's uh, world. Uh, it's a comprehensive approach to security, to human values, which are at the core of the Helsinki process. Um, and there is also a recognition of the vital role of civil society. The OSCE is an institution, and the civil society activists associated with the Helsinki movement contribute expertise to our partnership with Mediterranean states now undergoing transformations. Third, and relating to that same point, the Helsinki process must continue to champion citizen activism. Uh, Secretary Clinton last summer gave a, uh, an important speech uh, in Krakow, Poland, uh, talking about the uh, environment in which NGOs, which civil society are now being restricted by governments who are unhappy with their actions. Uh, the OSCE, through its engagement of civil society, reinforces our strategy of supporting citizen activism. Uh, in mid-August, my bureau will be reviewing proposals for a new $500,000 program to create a demand-driven virtual network of human rights and democracy activists 
in the OSCE region. We're calling it Helsinki 2.0. This will help extend Helsinki's human dimension and the legacy of citizen involvement. Last point is that I think it's important for us to send a clear message to Vil from Vilnius on internet freedom. Uh, I appreciate the Commission holding a hearing on that subject several weeks ago. We applaud Lithuania for making media freedom both via old and new technologies, uh, key themes of their chairmanship, and we're grateful for the tireless effort of the OSCE permanent uh, representative on freedom of the media, Dunja uh, Mijatovic. Uh, as Ambassador Gordon and I have both noted uh, the, in our written testimonies, the U.S. government is committed to uh, uh, fundamental freedoms in the digital age, and the Astana summit ended without adoption of a plan. We intend to renew our efforts uh, in the Vilnius ministerial. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, uh, I want to say that we are uh, committed to uh, a Europe that is whole, free, and at peace, Europe and Eurasia coming together in an integrated way, and there can't be lasting security in this region until human rights and fundamental freedoms can be fuller, fully exercised by all of the people within the OSC region. Again, I want to thank you for holding these hearings and for your own personal commitment to these issues. Well, well thank you for your testimony and thank you for your participation on the commission. Uh, Secre uh, Secretary Bershbo. Thank you, Senator Cardin, uh, and thanks to you and to Chairman Smith for uh, inviting me to testify about the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe and our goals in the run-up to the uh, Vilnius Ministerial Meeting in December. And I'm very honored to associate myself with this commission and its achievements uh, over the decades. Uh, like my colleagues, I have a longer statement that I'd like to submit for the record. And it will be. <clears throat> but I'll uh, just summarize some of the main points. The OSCE has three attributes that make it unique. Uh, it has a vast geographic scope. It has a three-basket approach to security encompassing human rights, economic development, as well as military security uh, that is still relevant today. And it has an extraordinary legacy, uh, having played a critical role both in supporting and inspiring uh, the forces of democracy and freedom behind the Iron Curtain during the Cold War and in bringing order during Europe's tumultuous political transitions of the early 1990s. Uh, throughout its history, the OSC has adapted to new challenges and changes in the security environment. And in keeping with this tradition, it must continue to adapt to face the challenges of the 21st century. Uh, as we've heard, last December, uh, the OSC held its first summit in Astana, uh, the first summit since 1999. Uh, at the summit, we learned that the achievements of the OSCE cannot be taken for granted. Uh, the effort to produce an action plan for 2011 foundered over fundamental disagreements on conventional arms control and the unresolved conflicts. Uh, fortunately, due in no small part to the efforts of my friend Phil Gordon, uh, the member states did succeed in producing the Astana Commemorative Declaration, which recommitted all 56 participating states to the Helsinki Principles and to revitalizing uh, the political military dimension of European security. And I'd like to focus on what the administration would like to accomplish in this area by the time of the ministerial in December, with, a, with a particular attention to the three most important parts of the conventional arms control regime, the 1999 Vienna document, the Open Skies Treaty, and the CFE Treaty. OSCE is engaged in an intensive effort to update the Vienna document for the first time since 1999. Uh, so far, the only changes that have been agreed uh, are administrative in nature. Uh, one substantive proposal that we believe would be critical to making the update a success is to lower the force thresholds for notification of military maneuvers, a subject that's uh, central to the original intention of the Vienna document. So far, only 35 of the 56 participating states have agreed to this proposal, but we think it would better reflect uh, reduced force sizes in Europe, and it would send a clear signal that OSCE is serious about modernizing military transparency and security in Europe, uh, even though this is not the only uh, updating that uh, should be done either before or beyond Vilnius. So we hope to have a deeper discussion with our OSCE partners on a range of measures that would be necessary to improve uh, the security of all participating states. With military budgets under pressure, we think that the Vienna document 
must continue to evolve to keep pace with the transformations underway across Europe's militaries. On open skies, the uh, 34 states party to the treaty have flown more than 700 aerial observation flights since the treaty entered into force in 2002. Uh, the ability of any party to overfly any part of the territory of every other party is actually quite extraordinary. And indeed, uh, the United States and Russia both use open skies to verify the New START treaty. We're seeking to recommit the United States to the treaty by increasing the number of flights in which we part participate each year and by upgrading our sensors uh, to digital. While many states are scaling back their participation due to budget cuts, uh, we note that Russia has renewed its commitment by pur purchasing new open skies aircraft. So we look uh, forward to the continued operation of this landmark treaty. The news on conventional armed forces in Europe, the CFE treaty, is uh, less encouraging. Uh, as you know, the CFE impasse began with Russia's December 2007 suspension of its compliance with the treaty. Uh, our efforts led by Ambassador Victoria Nuland to conclude a framework agreement as the starting point of negotiations to modernize the treaty have foundered on two main issues. Uh, the right of states to choose whether or not to allow foreign forces to be de stationed on their sovereign territory and providing transparency among all parties regarding their current military posture. Currently, the United States is consulting with the other parties to decide the way forward while continuing to encourage Moscow to reconsider its position. Uh, but as NATO said at the Lisbon summit last November, this situation in which 29 parties implement the treaty while one does not cannot continue indefinitely. And while the future of CFE remains uncertain, uh, we remain committed to conventional arms control and military transparency in Europe. And while the CFE treaty can't be replaced, we'll continue to work through the OSCE to advance these objectives by modernizing the Vienna document and uh, the Open Skies Treaty. We also seek to use the leverage of OSCE's diverse membership in trying to address the unresolved conflicts, and uh, we hope through cooperative efforts to resolve them. Uh, sadly, we've seen little sign of progress on resolving the conflict between Georgia and Russia. Talks do continue in Vienna and in Geneva on the possibility of an OSCE team that could, could have access to all of the territory of Georgia within its internationally recognized borders, but Russia has yet to agree. Our position remains unchanged. The United States continues to support Georgia's territorial integrity and sovereignty within its internationally recognized borders, and we will maintain our support for international efforts to find a peaceful resolution to the dis dispute over Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Russia needs to abide by its ceasefire arrangements and take steps that promote stability in the region. The OSC continues to play an important role in supporting a peaceful resolution of the dispute over Transnistria through the five plus two talks, and the United States remains closely engaged with our uh, OSCE Minsk Group co-chairs, Russia and France, in supporting efforts to uh, promote a peaceful settlement between Armenia and Azerbaijan over the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Uh, unfortunately, an attempt last month to reach a breakthrough failed, and tensions along the line of contact uh, are increasing. But with uh, the party's inability to finalize the Madrid basic principles to resolve the conflict, we remain at a dangerous stalemate, and prospects for progress remain uncertain. Now, the OSCE is also a forerunner among regional organizations in addressing emerging threats, such as preventing nuclear proliferation to non-state actors, the control of small arms and light weapons, the promotion of cybersecurity, and enhancing border security in Central Asia. On nonproliferation, uh, OSC continues to work towards full implementation of UN Security Council Resolution 1540. Uh, OSC is setting norms for its members uh, on nonproliferation by hosting specialized workshops and specialized tools for implementation. OSC is a vital forum for cooperation on reducing the threat posed by small arms and light weapons. Uh, it's facilitated cooperation among participating states in reducing trafficking securing existing stocks, and eliminating excess small arms and light weapons and related materials uh, since 1999. Uh, 
In March and July of this year, DOD participated in uh, OSCE-led OSCE visits to Kyrgyzstan, and we're now working to ensure that that country's manned portable air defense systems, or man pads, and we're also coordinating OSCE efforts to secure and destroy large stockpiles of hazardous conventional ammunition. On cybersecurity, OSCE hosted an important conference uh, to explore potential roles for the organization, uh, which included not only participating st states, partners, and international organizations, but uh, uh, the European Commission, Japan, and NATO. Uh, in the run-up to the Vilnius Ministerial, uh, the Pentagon will continue to support State Department-led discussions on developing cyber confidence-building mechanisms in the OSCE to pr protect our vital interests. We also have been working through OSCE to promote a stable, secure, and prosperous Central Asia by improving border security and working to combat illegal drug trafficking and other forms of proliferation across the region. Uh, we believe OSCE can do more in Afghanistan. Uh, the Secretariat has proposed 16 projects to enhance Afghan border security uh, with an emphasis on building Afghan capacity. Uh, these are supportive of the Afghanistan government's national development strategy. Uh, so far, only a few have been implemented, and we would like to see more progress between now and Vilnius on these very important projects. So to conclude, Senator, uh, in 1970, it was unlikely that NATO and the Warsaw Pact would hand each other their order of battle, publish advance warning of, of and invite observers to their large military exercises, conduct thousands of intrusive in inspections, and fly hundreds of uncontested reconnaissance sorties over each other's territories. But now we take these measures for granted. Uh, the OSCE, aided by this commission, remains an important tool to prevent future conflicts, to resolve the remaining conflicts in Eurasia, to address new threats as they emerge. We had hoped to be a bit further along by this year in projecting the peace and security of OSC to other areas of instability, but clearly much more work remains to be done. Uh, I hope that by the time of the Vilnius meeting in December, the Astana summit will ultimately be seen as a turning point in uh, reinvigorating OSCE's security dimension and moving it uh, boldly into the 21st century. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that uh, comprehensive pre presentation. I thank all three of you. Uh, it, it's clear to me that if the uh, Vilnius Ministerial is going to be successful, it's going to require a great deal of preparation work by the United States. We saw a year ago uh, with the Astana preparations were not up to what we wanted it to be. And I, I agree with the observations, uh, S Secretary Gordon, but for your work and, and the U.S. work, uh, I think that would have been um, a difficult um, uh, time. I think we, we pulled out at the end uh, some um, important work that was done in Astana, and I, I really do applaud the, the U.S. Uh, for your leadership there. We can't chance that again. I think we need better preparation moving into the ministerial. Of course, this is not a summit, so the expectations are nowhere near as high, but it it's still, I think, requires us. Uh, it's a once-a-year opportunity. And I listened to your, your, your testimony, and I think you do have the, the framework for some very important progress being made following up on Astana in Vilnius. And I just encourage you to, to work with our commission here so that we can try to reinforce what you're doing um, with the work of our, uh, of our commission. I, I want to just follow up, if I might, on uh, the point that uh, Secretary Feshbell, that you pointed out uh, the strength of the OSCE, its geographical uh, scope, the fact that it has the three baskets that are interwoven together, and the, its legacy. And we can all point with pride a lot of what's been done as a result of the uh, OSCE. On the geographical side, uh, since its inception, of course, the United States and Russia were equal partners in an organization in Europe, which gave it a unique opportunity for the relationship between the United States and Russia. Uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union, of course, now gives us opportunities in Central Asia that we did not have before. And that's still unclear as to how we're going to be using that opportunity to advance Central Asia. And now there's an interest in expanding the OSCE in the Mediterranean uh, beyond just our partner states. 
in using the framework. It was Max Kappelman who originally suggested that we create a separate OSCE for the Mediterranean. Uh, it, later he said, well, it would take too long to do that. Why don't we just try to expand the, the Middle East into OSCE? And we've been doing that. We've been doing that through the, the partnership status. Uh, there is some talk within the Parliamentary Assembly to try to give the Mediterranean partners uh, higher standing. I would be interested in the U.S. Uh, pursuing additional partner states in the Middle East as well as increased participation uh, in the uh, OSCE uh, for the, the partner states. So I guess if you could, and I would like to hear all three of you, uh, First, how you see us using the OSC as it relates to Russia, which I think is a real challenge. Uh, we have some of the real experts here on Russia. So what, what should we be looking to as far as the future of the OSC as it relates to Russia? Is Central Asia sort of stuck, or can we expect a, a greater uh, uh, role? And how about the Mediterranean dimension? And I'd be happy to begin and pick up on a couple of those, and I'm sure my colleagues will, will follow up. First, if I might, and thank you for your kind words about our work on the road to Astana, I would uh, note that your comments about the difficulty of Astana actually go hand in hand about, with your comments about the strength of the OSCE. Uh, the strength of the OSCE being that it works in all three dimensions, that there are 56 participating states, its geography covers a broad swath of issues, uh, that gives it uh, certain advantages. Everybody's involved and it's comprehensive. At the same time, uh, it creates challenges in advancing the agenda that we saw in Astana and we have no illusions about uh, on the road to Vilnius uh, and beyond. It is just something that we have to live with. Um, with a strong uh, chairmanship in uh, Lithuania uh, and our own work and the support of the Commission, we hope to, to uh, despite these sort of structural challenges make real progress uh, in Vilnius. On the work in other areas, let me just start with uh, the Mediterranean. Uh, we do believe that there's a role for the OSC in the Mediterranean, one that it is indeed already playing, even short of an OSC for the Mediterranean, which as you suggest, may be a bridge too far in the short term. Uh, the OSC is already uh, working with uh, neighboring states in the Mediterranean. I think I mentioned in my testimony a workshop on elections in Egypt uh, that just took place in the past couple of weeks. A number of OSC members from Central Europe have had workshops on democratic transitions, which is something also the OSC can help with, with years or even decades of experience of trying to support rule of law, democracy, free market economies in the OSC space. Uh, it can be useful to those uh, Mediterranean countries that are seeking that transition as well. And I guess I would say a similar thing about Central Asia, where the OSC is already uh, hard at work trying to do that, again, uh, facing many challenges, but trying to bring the lessons of what it has learned in, in decades of democratic support in Europe and Eurasia to Central Asia as well. And that will be another theme in Vilnius. Uh, finally, on Russia, uh, once again, it's a consensus organization. Uh, as Ambassador Verschbau said, we have had significant differences with Russia on some of the key issues we face, uh, including in the area of arms control. Uh, but we can't move forward without Russia. And uh, we are committed to working with the Russians as we need to uh, in, uh, in trying to strengthen the organization and take advantage of one of its most important voices in, uh, in the full range of issues. If I can just add a couple uh, thoughts to that. Um, I think uh, to share uh, Phil's observation, uh, clearly in places like Tunisia, Egypt, hopefully in Libya, there's going to be, there is a desire to engage with European partners and European countries that have gone through political transformations moving towards democracy. If the OSCE can be a forum for making that happen easy, in a more uh, of an easier way, then we should be encouraging that. And I think we're going to see in the, I spend a lot of my time now trying to deal with that region, and there is, uh, you know, these are countries that have had in many, uh, in, in many instances, 30 or 40 years without any functioning political systems. 
And so it's in our interest to facilitate that kind of exchange and engagement, uh, not so much to impose our thoughts of what's important, but try to have a real discussion among states that have been through a similar uh, transformation. I think the Central Asian piece from a human rights perspective is in some respects the most important. Those five Central Asian states don't have a Council of Europe or a, um, a Euro certainly not a European Union. And they're very, they're tough states. In, in human rights terms, we have a range of challenges. But I think the OSCE, however fragile the uh, uh, architecture and however difficult, I think is a platform, and it's an especially important platform for the civil society in those states who feel so marginalized by their own uh, political systems. So I think even though we continue to struggle over how to keep this as part of the mix, it's critically important in whatever we do that this be a piece of what we regard as a priority. And finally, again, to share Phil's uh, reflections on Russia, we have our own challenges in dealing with the Russians on a bilateral basis for human rights, um, but it's part of the reset, it's part of our policy, we'll continue to engage. We understand that these are issues in which we often don't agree, but that doesn't mean we don't have the conversation. And it spills over to the OSCE, where often the Russians are at loggerheads with us about how far the OSCE should go. It's critical we keep ODIR as a functioning strong entity, it's critical we keep doing the election monitoring, it's critical that the human dimension piece be strong and we keep that agenda where it needs to be. So we've got a, our work cut out for us, but I think we're pretty clear about what we need to do. Uh, thank you, Senator, for uh, posing some very good questions, interesting questions, challenging ones, because uh, it's ironic in the case of Russia that uh, the OSC itself was something that evolved from a Russian or Soviet initiative, Brezhnev's European Security Conference proposals. Yet now Russia seems less enthusiastic about the full three-basket structure and process that is at the heart of the OSCE. Uh, clearly, there's a lot to be done on some of the issues I discussed in my statement in the area of conventional arms control, and I think the Russians still are keenly interested in that, in that even if we are having serious uh, difficulties in the case of the CFE agreement and finding a framework that respects the key principles of host nation consent and, uh, and, and transparency that, uh, that I mentioned. Uh, but hopefully the Russians will ultimately see that a world without any CFE agreement, without the predictability and transparency that comes with negotiated arms control will be a much more uh, unreliable basis on which to build European security in the future. Uh, but we do face a bigger challenge in, in getting all three baskets uh, back into the category of areas where the Russians are actively cooperating with us in the OSC framework and indeed in other areas as well. Uh, Mike's addressed the human rights uh, issues. I think in the area of conflict prevention and crisis management, we've been trying for the last few years to strengthen OSC's ability to act proactively at the early stages of conflict, uh, but there too uh, we've encountered uh, Russian resistance to giving more authority to the chairman in office to, to take the initiative to send a fact-finding mission to a, an emerging area of conflict. But this ultimately should be in Russia's interest. We all will save a lot in terms of uh, potential for bloodshed and, and expenditure of our treasure if we can nip conflicts in the bud through political means, and that's where OSC has great strengths that should, uh, should be built upon. I see tremendous potential in Central Asia to focus on some of the transnational issues uh, as well as the human rights issues, uh, since those countries do indeed not have as many other institutional frameworks to which they can turn. And I think there too, with uh, whether you're looking at drug trafficking, terrorism, organized crime, regional approaches that could be facilitated by OSC uh, would, uh, would be tremendous contributors to Russia's security and to, uh, to everyone else's. On the uh, Mediterranean countries, uh, I agree with my colleagues that the experience of the transition of uh, the post-Cold War period is certainly something that OSC could help uh, in sharing with the, uh, the countries of the Middle East and, and uh, North Africa. There may be uh, me me mechanisms that could be transposed from the European framework to the Mediterranean framework in the security area as well, helping countries in transition 
uh, develop uh, civilian control of the military, civil military relations. Uh, and here, too, there may be a, an increased role for NATO, which has had a Mediterranean dialogue, which has largely been a consultative forum, but may now have some operational role in the spirit of the Partnership for Peace, what, what the Partnership for Peace did in Central and Eastern Europe and in the Balkans in the post-Cold War period. So it's an organization with tremendous potential, and we hope we can begin to realize more of that at, at Vilnius and beyond. And I agree with you on your points about closer preparation, and we will certainly want to coordinate closely with the Commission as we go forward. Well, I pr appreciate that. Secretary Posner, as you were talking about Russia and uh, progress made in human rights and that we can deal with that and deal with other issues at the same time, it, it reminded me of my first involvement with the Helsinki Commission dealing with Soviet Jews many years ago. And at that time, the, the logic of naming names was being challenged internationally. And naming names, I think, was perhaps the most effective way that uh, the Commission was able to advance uh, uh, basic rights uh, by putting a face on the issue. And I think most recently, uh, and you mentioned the Sergei Magnitsky case, I think that also uh, galvanized international attention. And although Russia may not like the fact that we have brought uh, this on a personal level, it does um, uh, bring it home that they have failed to live up to commitments under the OSCE. So I, I just encourage us to continue to, be, to, be, to do that. I know there's a lot of pressure not to embarrass countries because of individual cases, but to me that's the only way, the most effective way, not the only way, the most effective way uh, that we're going to be able uh, to make progress towards compliance with the principles of OSCE. One last question I have, which is a process question, and that is you know, the, the, uh, the OSCE, the CSCE, is 36 years old when it was first uh, developed. There was the Soviet Union. We didn't have, uh, didn't have a parliamentary assembly. Uh, Vienna was not what it is today. Uh, we're seeing things that are happening. The consensus process is being challenged. Transparency is clearly a problem within OSCE. There's uh, mixed signals we're getting from many capitals around the OSCE region as to how much support they're giving in Vienna. Uh, how does the United States interject itself into uh, reforms within the OSCE? Uh, we have direct interest in the Parliamentary Assembly. It's played a critical role in uh, election monitoring, one of the principal uh, services provided by the OSCE. There's always there's been friction between ODIR and the Parliamentary Assembly. Uh, we have the Secretary General of the Parliamentary Assembly, who happens to be with us today, Spencer Oliver, who was here in Congress when the original Helsinki Act was passed and has a lot of institutional um, uh, knowledge of what needs to be done. I guess, as I saw the results in Astana, I realized that but for the United States, we would not have been able to achieve what we did. It seems to me that reform within OSCE will not take place unless the United States is in the leadership. And how do, how do we develop that? How, do, how does the United States put these issues? I, I say that fully supportive of the importance of the OSCE today with all of its problems. But it could be much more effective. I think we all agree. How do we go about exercising that leadership in the United States? Again, I'm, I'm happy to start, and I'll start by saying, you know, we share your premise, uh, especially those of us who try to work with the organization on a regular basis. Uh, it is clear that it is suffering from the consensus principle and a lack of political will among countries to, uh, to allow it to function as, as efficiently as it needs to. So how do we deal with that, and how have we been trying to do it? First of all, as you say, uh, through our own U.S. leadership and vigorous action. Secretary Clinton herself has personally invested in this. That's why she went to Astana. Uh, that's why she has focused on this whole set of uh, issues. The organization has a new secretary general, and we will give him our full support, a very a competent uh, Italian and experienced Italian diplomat. Uh, you mentioned the parliamentary assembly, which we will also support. Uh, this commission and through our own uh, efforts, we uh, have tried to find ways to make the organization more efficient by allowing it to act in some cases when there isn't a consensus. 
and I, I think we mentioned using the what's called the Moscow mechanism in Belarus. Obviously, when we want to follow up on the very flawed elections and the uh, uh, use of violence by the regime that followed those elections last December, if the OSCE had to wait for every member to agree, that is to say, including Belarus, uh, it couldn't have played a role. So we invoked and supported the use of this Moscow mechanism where a smaller number of OSCE countries can send uh, an observer investigator into a, a member state. And naturally, there was re uh, resistance to that in some quarters, but we actually managed to do it, and I might add, uh, um, uh, including uh, uh, with, with Russian support. So there are ways to use the organization. It's not easy, but those types of mechanisms can make it more efficient. We tried to suggest a similar reform when it comes to crisis response. Uh, at present, because of the consensus rule, the OSC is just too slow. Uh, if uh, violence breaks out in a participating state, and most of us think it would be useful to have the OSC send someone, uh, it is necessary to get support of all of them, and, and lo and behold, it's not surprising that, that maybe the state that is using force doesn't want it to happen. And we have tried to suggest that it would be more effective to, uh, to have a crisis response mechanism that didn't rely on consensus, whether it's minus one or minus two or minus three. But that is one of the issues uh, we have uh, not reached consensus on, including from Russia, uh, which is reluctant to allow for that capacity. We still support it. We still think it would be a good idea to prevent a single country from blocking the organization as a whole to have a crisis response action. So that, that's unfortunate, and we, we will continue to, to try to lobby for that change. And then lastly, I would just say that, uh, to remind us all, that even when the organization at 56 in Vienna is stymied by a lack of consensus, we shouldn't overlook the importance of uh, the sub-organizations of the OSC, um, including uh, ODIR, including the, the High Representative for Freedom of the Media, including the High Commissioner for National Minorities. These organizations are effective, sometimes quietly. Uh, so uh, you know, I just remind us all that even as we get frustrated sometimes maybe by an inability to get the entire organization to work, that, is not, that doesn't take anything away from the effectiveness of some of these uh, subgroups. Thank you, Senator, and thanks, Phil. Phil has covered some points that I would have made. Um, I think bottom line is you're right that American leadership is going to be critical to not only keeping the organization effective in what it's doing now, but in getting it to engage in, in new areas where I think it can fill a, a, a void in the uh, overall security architecture of Europe and Eurasia. Uh, so we have to be very persistent in our diplomacy, patient but not too patient. I think we have to recognize that uh, if the institution uh, doesn't uh, overcome what is, I think, fair to call a crisis of confidence on the part of some of its members in, in, in the institution itself, then uh, it will be relegated to a, a second-tier second status. So I think that uh, we have to continue to work very hard to persuade the countries that have become more skeptical about, about OSC that it, it really is an asset that they can use to deal with their own uh, security problems can help them in dealing with uh, with threats uh, on their doorstep, uh, preventing conflicts from emerging. Uh, that it's not a burden; it's a relatively uh, affordable institution in terms of what we spend on it, but it can deliver significant results. Um, but so clearly, some co countries still see OSC uh, as a threat, and we have to uh, overcome that uh, that attitude. Uh, we certainly, from the DOD point of view, try to talk up OSC in our defense dialogues with uh, countries in, in Europe and, uh, and, and Eurasia. Uh, we certainly took a proactive role in the effort to revitalize the CFE uh, treaty, and while it has not yet borne fruit, uh, we're still uh, committed to trying to shape an approach that uh, can respect the principles that are important to, uh, to all the member states. Um, but get that negotiating process back on track and, and bring the agreement up to date in light of new geopolitical realities. Uh, so uh, again, persistence uh, in our diplomacy will be key, uh, but clearly we have an uphill climb ahead of us. 
just a couple words to add what both have said. Um, having uh, attended both the Human Dimension meeting in, uh, in Warsaw and the summit in Astana last year, um, it is clear to me how much um, the United States leadership is vital. Um, and I think it's incumbent on us also to be uh, redoubling our efforts to um, engage ever, uh, at every level the Western European allies that should be standing with us on all of these issues. They're there, but they wait sometimes for us to lead. And for this organization to succeed, we have to have a critical mass of countries that are all working at full speed in the way that we do as a delegation. I'm very proud to be part of this government because I see how much time and energy we put into these issues. Second thing, I think it is important that we change the dynamic in a different way, which is that we've got to move to create allies, for example, in the Central Asian area. It's one of the reasons I mentioned Kyrgyzstan twice. I'm going to mention it now a third time. It represents a potential change in the atmosphere and the environment of all of these, of this organization, if we can reinforce the best instincts of an emerging democracy in Central Asia, which Kyrgyzstan could be. We're not there yet, but it would be a model. It would suggest that we, we have an ally in a different place um, where we could begin to build, uh, I think, some new uh, dynamic uh, uh, changes. The third thing, just following on what Phil said, I I'm very high on the work of the, represent the high representative on the media. I think she's done an outstanding job. I also think the three tolerance uh, representatives, Andy Baker in particular, who's focused on anti-Semitism, below the radar in some ways, but taking on very tough issues, doing real factual uh, fact gathering and building a kind of momentum on very tough issues that are particularly important now in Europe. And so that agenda, the tolerance agenda to me is a critically important one. We've got to, again, pay attention and make sure that the resources and the political support is behind that. Last point, Senator, in, in relation to your comment on Magnitsky. I think it's really important for us also to be taking on the tough cases to make that part of the routine. Sometimes we do it privately, and when we can see, succeed, that's the best. But as you've done in the Magnitsky case, you've raised the profile. You've caused us to, to you know, redouble our efforts. We were very engaged, but we're now engaged some more. And we've certainly seen the reaction uh, on the Russian side is that uh, you, you've gotten their attention, and I think that's a good thing. Well, I, I thank you all for, for your observations there. I, I, I was going to make a, an observation that the um, parliamentary assembly parliamentarians can really help you bring about the type of consensus you need, but I didn't think this was a good day for me to mention that considering where we are in Congress. But I, I do think that the, 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 the political involvement of the parliamentary assembly can help. You, as you mentioned, and I think rightly so, that the institutions within OSCE add a great deal of strength, even though we need consensus for overall action, we have the institutions that are now well established. I might point out that in almost every one of those cases, it was the leadership of the United States that either initiated or funded their operations. There was a lot of extra budgetal, budgetary support that the United States was behind to support the human rights uh, 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 capacity of OSCE, and of course the tolerance was the U.S. initiative. So it, it, it just, I guess I, what I would encourage us all to do is, as we look towards the future, how do we transform OSCE to continue to be relevant to meet the current needs? And um, that's why I look at expanding its geographical side. I, I look at some of the uh, steps that we could take uh, to integrate a better relationship between the Parliamentary Assembly and the Permanent Council and, the, and what happens in Vienna. Those issues, I think, our election monitoring, which is one of our signature issues, um, and to make sure that we continue to have the type of support uh, to be able to carry out those important functions. I, I think all that would be important for us to continue. Uh, just one positive note before we uh, call the second panel. We, our annual meeting was in uh, Belgrade. And we look in the Balkans today, and I, I think although there's still many challenges, Kosovo and Bosnia are very much um, at risk, uh, but clearly the progress that's been made in the Balkans reflect not just the work of the OSCE, but the leadership of the United States. 
And I, I couldn't tell you how proud we were to see the progress that was made in Serbia. I mean, I, Serbia was one of my principal countries of interest just a few years ago for its failure to meet OSCE commitments. And now it's uh, clearly on the path uh, for uh, uh, moving towards the EU. And that's, uh, I think, a credit to uh, the, the, the support of the United States and the support uh, of the OSCE to the process. So I think there's been uh, a lot of successes that we can point to, but we still have challenges that we have to meet. And with that, thank you all very much, and we'll move to the second panel. And again, I apologize for the delay. The, uh, just uh, for the record, there may be, tell our first panel, there may be questions that we'll be submitting for the record. We would ask if you would get them back to us in a timely way. The second panel uh, will consist of Dr. Mike Hatzel, Senior Fellow at the Center for Transatlantic Relations at Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies and a Senior Advisor at the international consulting firm of Molarty Associates. We also have Kathy Fitzpatrick, a consultant to the Human Rights Organization, a frequent contributor to online publications at Eurasia and about the OSCE, and also a Russian translator. She has testified for our commission on several times and has served as a public member of the U.S. delegation to the OSCE Human Dimensions in 1991, 2004, and 2010. And I appreciate the patience of both of you for, obviously we're a little bit delayed, um, and we will uh, try to move this on. Uh, we will keep the record open for questions from uh, members of the commission. We would ask our witnesses if questions are asked to try to respond to them as promptly as possible. Dr. Dr. Hotzel, be glad to start with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's, uh, I would ask, first of all, that the full text of my written remarks be entered into the record. And it'd be true for both witnesses. Your full testimony will be included in the record. You may proceed as you wish. Thank you. It's an honor and a pleasure to participate in today's hearing. I'd like to take this opportunity to commend you and uh, Congressman Smith for your energetic leadership of the Helsinki Commission in a policy world where coping with daily crises makes it easy not to see the forest for the trees. The Helsinki Commission stands out for its ability to examine both current problems and their deeper causes. I would also mention the quote unquote foot soldiers of our OSCE policy. During the past two years, I've had the honor of being the head of three US delegations to OSCE conferences, the 2009 HDIM in Warsaw, 2010 Copenhagen 20th Anniversary Conference and the 2010 Vienna Review Conference. I can honestly say, Senator, I've never encountered a more expert, hardworking, and effective group of public servants than the members of those three, those three delegations and the officials backing them up here in Washington, D.C. Several of them are here in the room today. I think the American people are being extraordinarily well served by and should be proud of these U.S. federal employees. Mr. Chairman, a lot of the territory was covered eloquently by the three assistant secretaries on the first panel. I will attempt to give a somewhat more general summary uh, of an outsider who on occasion has been part of the OSCE process. When one views the Helsinki process over the nearly four decades of his existence, one must, I believe, judge it to have been a resounding success. The, the old CSCE played a significant role in hastening the demise of communism in Europe, the Caucasus, and Central Asia, and the territory of the OSCE today is unquestionably in much better shape than it was when the founders began their uh, deliberations in the Finnish capital in the early 1970s. That's the relatively good news, the bad news, and I think we've heard it uh, again in the first panel and from you also, Senator, is that since it's arguably its high point in 1990 at the Copenhagen Conference on the Human Dimension, where actually I was a public member, um, the organization has in many respects been a disappointment. To be sure, it faces formidable challenges. We've talked about Uzbekistan and Andijan, the massacre in 2005, Kyrgyzstan, 
which has a new democratic government and there is some hope nonetheless had a violent repressive leader who fled last year. We know about the insurgency spreading in Russia's largely Muslim North Caucasus, where Moscow has farmed out control of Chechnya to a brutal warlord. Um, these and other abuses, again, were outlined by the first panel and by um, Chairman Smith. Russia's military continues illegally to occupy parts of Georgia and Moldova. Talks on the, on the protracted conflicts seem stalled. What has the OSCE been able to do to remedy these problems? Unfortunately, I don't think enough. Last December's first in a decade OSCE summit undoubtedly uh, accomplished a formal reaffirmation of the organization's lofty principles. We deserve credit for leadership there, Phil Gordon especially. In a healthy organization, however, I submit that this reaffirmation would have been considered unnecessary. And we, as you know, did plan for an action plan. My, my final statement at Vienna, we outlined nine areas where the United States felt progress had to be made or we could not agree to an action plan. I'm glad we stuck to our principles because it would have been incomplete otherwise. The consensus rule we've talked about has become an increasing burden. Uh, Non-democratic members, Russia above all, continually stymie organizational progress. We've talked about uh, American crisis response proposals that have been blocked, preventive action in the North Caucasus, aid in Afghanistan. Um, the lack of an enforcement mechanism is also a fundamental weakness of the OSCE. At the Copenhagen conference last June, where several of the people in, uh, on, on the staff were also present as members of the delegation, we had a remarkably free and open discussion in the last session. And all of the, all of the countries basically said that the, the, the lack of an enforcement mechanism uh, is a serious flaw. The public naming and shaming of human rights violators at the HDIM drives non-democratic participating states up the wall. That's fine. And occasionally it does improve the conditions of imprisoned civil rights advocates. It rarely alters general governmental behavior. Doesn't mean we shouldn't continue trying. We should. As several people have said, in the face of constant stonewalling, some segments of the OSCE do manage to carry out their mandates with distinction. I would cite especially uh, Dunya Miadovic, the representative of freedom of the media, Odir, of course, uh, Knut Folebeck, the o OSCE High Commissioner on National Minorities, the Parliamentary Assembly, and last but not least, the valuable field missions and training programs of the organization. I won't repeat what Secretary Vershbaugh had to say about the arms control mandate. It's abundantly clear that Moscow's refusal to accept the host nation consent principle and, and transparency is a, is a, a real disappointment. Uh, I certainly hope that the update of the Vienna document at the December uh, Vilnius ministerial will succeed. So finally, we have an organization whose effectiveness varies widely. As a norm setter, the OSCE has few, if any, equals. Its specialized agencies and field missions remain valuable international players. But in enforcing its democratic and human rights principles and its arms control uh, efforts, the OSCE has proved to be a disappointment. So what should we do? Mr. Chairman, frustrating though it may be to some, I would argue for more, not less, commitment to the organization. U.S. leadership, as we've all heard, is absolutely essential. We should redouble our commitment both in personnel and in behavior. We have excellent people at our uh, permanent mission in, in, in Vienna and a first-rate staff. We should continue to introduce constructive initiatives, such as more effective crisis response mechanisms, which had been vetoed until now, updating the Vienna document, as I said, internet freedom, uh, greater economic transparency, more gender equality. Many of these may be vetoed. Um, but nonetheless, I think demonstrating that the U.S. is a good international citizen and a leader at the OSCE has intrinsic value that should not be underestimated. Um, at the HDIM, in that same vein, we should always be candid about our own national shortcomings. We should publicly own up to our deficiencies, as we have done, but then we should explain the measures that we're taking to try to rectify them. This 
increases our credibility within the organization, especially among the European participating states. I think the United States should always be the foremost champion of NGOs and their right to participate in OSCE conferences and, whenever possible, even in permanent council meetings. In the negotiations over all manner of OSCE documents, from routine announcements to treaties, we should be second to none as paragraph experts, even if people consider us nitpickers. Finally, Mr. Chairman, we should never go along to get along. On the vast majority of issues confronting the OSCE, we are in agreement with our European friends and allies. Occasionally, however, if they are willing, allegedly, quote unquote, for the good of the organization, to acquiesce in resolutions or draft agreements that we feel would jeopardize our national interest or compromise the principles of the OSCE, we must resist group pressure to provide consensus. No matter how much eye rolling it may occasion, our being a minority of one in such rare cases is not only ethically sound, but also organizationally the most supportive position for the OSCE. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my testimony. I thank you again for the opportunity to offer my views. I look forward to attempting to answer any of your questions. Well, thank you again for your testimony. Ms. Fitzpatrick. Thank you, Senator, especially for treating the OSCE as the indispensable organization. What I would like to do today in my testimony is to focus on the excellent recommendations that have already been made by the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly in the Belgrade de Declaration. Uh, but it needs some focus as it's a very long document. OSCE should concentrate on developing a more effective capacity to re react diplomatically to crisis with particular attention to strengthening human rights investigation capacity and high-level public statements on crises. There is a very frayed political con consensus now, and the OSCE faces not only its long-standing set of frozen, in some places, thawing conflicts, but new challenges as we've seen this last year the pogroms in Kyrgyzstan, the brutal crackdown in Belarus, the regression on press freedom by Kazakhstan even as it was chairing the organization, and of course the appalling ter terrorist attacks in Russia, Belarus, and now uh, tragically in Norway. We never expected these kind of tragedies when we saw the Berlin Wall fall, when, when the Soviet Union dismantled, and it seems as if our Helsinki ideals have not come to pass. We, the organization has not been able to predict or respond to these kinds of incidents uh, effectively. So to that end, um, we must increase the complementarity, integration, and effectiveness of the various offices. Uh, we should um, work to, at the ministerial level on a consensus minus one basis to have a standby rapid reaction diplomatic mission. Uh, we should strengthen the ability of ODIR, uh, the High Commissioner for Nationalities, the various special representatives in the Parliamentary Assembly to mount fact-finding missions as an integral part of their function. We should also enable the OSCE Secretary General and other OSCE leaders to speak out more in con condemnation of human rights violations and not just leave it to the, to the rapporteurs. All the deployed missions should have a human rights component and they should report more publicly than they do. Um, all, the, in, all the various institutions of OSCE should report to the Permanent Council more, and uh, that body should become more transparent. Um, I would advocate creating an OSCE mandate for freedom of association with particular focus on human rights defenders. This was done successfully by the U.S. at the U.N. Human Rights Council, and that could be replicated. And we should ensure that groups that incite hatred or violence or that call for the destruction of any state or for the destruction of anyone's rights do not receive government support. So the fact-finding, which used to be at the heart of Helsinki experience with the citizens' movement, it seems to everywhere have been substituted with technical assistance and training seminars. And that's a, strat a strategy that evolved to cope with the refusal of some states to admit observers and accept criticism of their record. Uh, through extraordinary efforts, the Finnish politician Kimo Kiljunen was able to mount a prestigious fact-finding panel in Kyrgyzstan, as you know. Its findings represent an important validation of the fact that while 75% of the victims were ethnic Uzbeks, nearly 100% of those tried for the violence are also ethnic Uzbeks, and this disparity represents a, dis a grave injustice. Although he was invited to investigate the, the June uh, pogroms by President Rosa Atumbayeva, Kiljunen was subsequently uh, 
denounced by the Kyrgyz parliament and declared persona non grata. So the OSCEPA has followed up with this. Uh, there's been hearings with NGOs and so on, but more is required. The Lithuanian chair in office should immediately appoint a special envoy on Central Asia to continue to press for implementation of the commission's recommendations. And there is a precedent for such, for such an envoy. Um, as good as it was, this commission exposed significant weaknesses in OSCE. The lack of a well-functioning, permanent institution staffed with regional experts and lawyers to perform fact-finding missions in rapid and thorough fashion. Throughout OSCE's history, the function of fact-finding has performed by different offices in different ways at different times. Sometimes it's ODIR, with, with a very good report on Kosovo and Chechnya in the past, and on Andijan. Sometimes it's the High Commissioner for Nationality. Sometimes it's the Parliamentary Assembly. So this is where uh, this needs to be coordinated and institutionalized better. This process of fact-finding should be shielded from political processes. And to that end, the various OD uh, bodies, such as ODIR and Parliamentary Assembly, should coordinate better and institutionalize their fact-finding and interact with the Vienna Conflict Prevention Center and the Permanent Council. Uh, the right to know and act upon one's rights, which was the inspiration for the founding of the Helsinki Citizens Movement, is still not a reality even 35 years later. Regrettably, work on behalf of NGO legalization has devolved into a very tedious and expensive exercise in technical assistance to uh, two states for drafting laws on civic association parties. But for some governments, that turns into an opportunity to exhibit their duplicity and procrastination. So I would rather see, instead of this focus on drafting laws, I would like the OSCE to have a special mandate to focus on the civic organizations that already exist and, and their actual problems and to intervene with states on their behalf, particularly for, the, for human rights monitors. And even as we want to promote civil society, we also have to be mindful of groups that have incite imminent violence, and that speaks to the role of the tolerance mandates and so on to uh, report more uh, effectively. Um, the permanent council could indeed become more open and transparent. Um, while some officials do brief these meetings, the head of ODIR, the tolerance rapporteurs, the, the mission heads, they're an invaluable resource, they should all be coming to the permanent council and reporting more. As for the call for public meetings at, at the permanent council, well, we have seen at the UN Security Council that regrettably, when you have open meetings, they can lead to more public posturing and canned speeches, and it drives the real work then even further behind the scenes. So what I feel is more op operative is that even if the Sausage making of diplomacy is hidden from us. We should see the product of it more often. So that means more consensus, consensus texts from the chair, more negotiated re resolutions, more reporting. The US, of course, has set a good example already by publishing their speeches uh, to the Permanent Council. Few others, if any, do. Um, as for briefing by NGOs, there was a call in the Belgrade Declaration to make this as often as once a week. I fear that would only uh, lead to spe some special interest posturing again, and also only those wealthy organizations that can afford to stay in Vienna would be able to report. So I would like to see uh, other ways of just incorporating the uh, NGO information better and also arranging briefings occasionally. Um, work on the charter status for OSCE should be delayed. An organization that has had two missions expelled or suspended in Belarus and Georgia and has had grave situations where OSCE monitors or police advisors could not be deployed in a timely fashion or were expelled, as we saw in Belarus, Georgia, Kyrgyzstan, that's not an organization that should be drafting a charter until a, a basic consensus on both the nature and the remedies for these situations is reached. We all lament the absence of teeth for the many good findings and recommendations of OSCE. A debate on membership or expulsion criteria will likely be futile. We could try to agree that no state seriously violating Helsinki principles should be allowed to chair the organization, and yet that is also a process we find we're not able to start, to, st to, to, to question. But what we can do is create benchmarks that are very clear for what we expect of, of the chair, for example, Ukraine coming in, and articulate those forcefully well in advance, and to protect those groups inside the, the country that continue to expose the violations by that, by the state that is serving as chair. So there's, there's little that we can do sometimes, but when all else fails, we can refuse to validate a state's behavior 
And that's when, when, when we look at some of the challenges coming up, for example, the Russian elections, uh, I think it's very important not to reopen the process of evaluating criteria for monitoring. We should leave that as is and, and hopefully make the same kind of credible statement about these elections that, that Odir and, and others have made in the past. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank both of you for your, for your, for your testimony. You've given us a lot of really good ideas on the type of reform. You know, I, I put at the top of the list consensus minus one, particularly as it relates to administrative decisions, so we can move faster in that. Transparency, to me, is a huge issue within OSCE. The development of the um, structure in Vienna, which seems to be, in many cases, independent of the of the member state capitals and, and how we get greater um, uh, response in Vienna, quicker response, and to be able to work more effectively to deal with current issues. I think all that's important. I, I want to ask one question, and we may have some qu additional questions for the record. And this is one that I don't think has been given a lot of thought as to whether this is the best way to move forward within OSCE. And that is the chair in office. I mean, some of your proposals are to give more authority to the secretary general or to allow the, the, uh, the different institutions to be able to, to move forward or to have greater accountability within the institutions directly to the secretary general. But it seems to me that so much depends upon the chair in office within OSCE. And I must tell you, I'm not sure there's a clear path as to how the future chairmanships are going to be determined within OSCE. There's certainly a geographical dis discussion going on now. And I don't know what the answer is, but I am concerned about so much dependent upon uh, which country is the chair within OSCE uh, and whether there isn't a better way to provide a direction than uh, a yearly rotation of a chair from one of the member states. Well, Senator, I would, I would keep the chair in office because it's, as with other multilateral organizations, you have the EU changes every six months. You have the UN Security Council changes its presidency every month. So changing once a year isn't so terrible. And in any multilateral organization, you're, going to, you're, you're in a dialogue with some states that are not like-minded. Sooner or later, if they're members, they're going to rotate into the chair. I think what a lot of time was spent during Kazakhstan Stan's chair in trying to explain precedents to them and bolstering precedents for good practices by chairs. So, a, so that's I important. I don't disagree with that. I'm, I'm really raising this not so much to suggest that there be a, a different, but how do you deal with that? With Kazakhstan coming in as chair in office, it was so much attention on the chair that it really, in some respects, detracted from the organization. I agree that it did detract, and I think that's where we have to work at bolstering ODIR and, and uh, the capacity of other bodies to do fact-finding, because the chair, uh, during the Kazakh chair, there, there was very poor response on fact-finding in crisis. Uh, but on the other hand, things like pointing, uh, I mentioned appointing the special envoy, that is within the power of the chair. There's not a lot you can do, but they do have this discretionary power to appoint uh, people and, and and how they shape the human dimension seminars, what the topics are. So there is some scope there for, for making the chair effective. I agree with you, Senator. It's a real problem. Don't forget, we were one of the last countries to agree to Kazakhstan's chairmanship in office. You know all about that. I, I believe the UK and the Czech Republic were the other two. There were meetings in, uh, uh, in Madrid. They, they promised some things, uh, several of which they, they never delivered on. Uh, I'm not enamored of the idea, and yes, the EU has a rotating presidency, but they've whittled that way, way down as a result of their newest, uh, I mean, basically the presidency of the EU means a whole lot less than it did uh, before the Lisbon Treaty, so I'm not sure that that's much of a model. Um, look, I think what we can do is, first of all, be very careful about who gets into the, into the chairmanship, and then we can bolster them. As you well know, we have been helping the Lithuanians. I think that's, that's extremely good. Todd Becker, one of our experienced diplomats, uh, I'm told, has been seconded there for the year, and, and, uh, we can, and, and some of the smaller countries need that sort of help. And, and in, in fact, I remember when Slovenia was, was, 
was chairman of the office several years ago. They send people over here to talk to us to try to help them. But beyond that, I don't know. Uh, I, have, I have the same sort of doubts that you do. If I could backtrack on just one thing very briefly, uh, and that has to do with, with the uh, suspension idea. I, I, I had that in my written statement, but I, I feel that, yes, the Moscow mechanism is being used against Belarus right now, but we heard from an earlier testimony that the, that the Belarusians are managing to stonewall even within the Moscow mechanism. Um, it is not unheard of to suspend a country from the uh, OSCE. It was done in 1992 against Yugoslavia, then Serbia and Montenegro because of the wars there. Uh, I think if one is talking about leverage, I think the United States should carefully consider bringing up a resolution of suspension unless Belarus cooperates fully with the Moscow mechanism and changes some of its behavior. Well, our, our delegation to the Parliamentary Assembly a couple of years ago uh, challenged uh, Belarus, and we didn't get very far. So it's a tough thing to, to actually accomplish. But I, and your point is, is, is very well taken. Let, let me ask you one final question as it relates to Russia. What do you think, uh, we know what Russia's intense, intentions were when the, uh, when the CSCE was formed. They, they wanted legitimacy in the international community and they thought that they could withstand the, the scrutiny. And uh, now we're not exactly sure what their intentions are. Would you want to share with us what you think our best strategy should be with Russia as it relates to the OSCE? Senator, I think they have, uh, to some extent, contradictory strategies. Don't forget, in 2008, President Medvedev gave a speech in Berlin outlining his idea for a new European security architecture, which was brought up within the OSCE, and I'm happy to say has more or less died a peaceful death. It would have clearly undermined NATO, and, and it, was, it should have been, and I think really was a non-starter. I testified before the Permanent Council on this in 2009. Um, I, my own feeling is that Russia uh, would like HDIM to vanish from the face of the earth. They would like to concentrate on the arms control areas to their own advantage, and they don't, they don't really care very much about the economic and environmental. I think they're, uh, I don't think they want to see the whole organization die. I think they'd be happy to see it just sort of dangle in the wind. What should we do about this? I think what, what we should do about it is, is what we should do about the whole organization, redouble our commitment. Mm -hmm. Put them on the spot. I mean, they had, they've, they, they had a, a perm rep in Vienna who was the, <laughs> I have to laugh, the most aggressive but skillful man imaginable. I mean, and he would just, just bull straight ahead. There's only one way to deal with that, is, is just have more staying power than they do. Uh, be completely open about, about uh, the arguments they're making being specious, uh, be the last delegation to leave a negotiation, uh, and, and, and show our European friends that we're, that we're leaders and that we're good international citizens and that we want to be the leaders of the OSCE. Good point. Well, I think on the challenge of Russia, that it, it was actually a very explicit plan of Russia to undermine OSCE's human rights components which, from their letter some years ago that was signed also by Kazakhstan and others. I think they've worked very methodically at destroying budgets, undermining the principles. So I think they have to be called on that. And I think the elections presents a profound opportunity, but also a challenge because there'll be, Odir and others will be under enormous pressure to call that as being valid. And we can already see with the crackdown on Live Journal and with many problems in Russia, that there are real, real conditions don't obtain for free and fair elections. So I think focusing on the election is very important. And I also think that the Moscow mechanism has to mechanize in Moscow on Belarus. We have to explicitly negotiate with Russia on Belarus. There's one school of thought that says never raise Belarus with Russia because that puts it into their sphere of influence. But they're the ones who bail out Lukashenko. Their television is also very important. So I think any component, you know, programming that we do should focus on Russian television. It's no Al Jazeera for this region by any stretch, but it's all we have as far as reaching the whole region by satellite. So we should work more on getting on Russian television to, to make known our views. Well, let me thank both of you. I think your testimonies have been very helpful to us as we try to chart the future. 
uh, leading up to the ministerial in, in Vilnius, but more importantly, leading to the future of the OSCE. Uh, with that, our hand, hearing will stand adjourned. Thank you all very much.